Chapter 14, Race Against Time. Jim Whitaker finally fell asleep just before dawn the next morning. It had been a fitful night, not because of the pain or the miserable, miserable jumble of legs and arms in the rafts. For once, he was excited. Yesterday, he had seen the evening patrol pass closer than it had the last three days. The rafts had drifted two, maybe three miles apart. Surely this time, the kingfisher had flown right over one of them. Whitaker was convinced that something good was about to happen. He hadn't been asleep long when he felt DeAngelis shaking him by the shoulder and yelling his name. Whitaker was groggy from the lack of sleep. Cut that out, he croaked. What's the matter with you? Jim, you'd better take a look, DeAngelis said. It may be a mirage, but I think I see something. Whitaker propped himself up in the raft and looked toward the horizon. It was no mirage. Ten or twelve miles out, the line where the sea met the sky bristled with the faint outline of trees. The sight was more than enough to rouse Whitaker. He set the oars, gathered his strength, and started rowing. DeAngelis took over from time to time, but he could only pull for a few minutes. Before collapsing, Reynolds lay behind Whitaker, too weak to sit up all the way. I feel all right, he would say. Just tired. I'll get up in a minute and help you, Jim. When the sun rose high, he, f he filled flare cartridges with seawater and poured them over Whitaker's head. Seven and a half hours later, they fought their way through a riptide in a storm and eased themselves over a shallow reef. DeAngelis lay across the bow, guiding the raft with his hand so it didn't rip on the sharp coral. Finally, they ran aground 40 feet from shore. They had been at sea for 21 days, three weeks of constant motion, and now they had come to rest. They had each, at various times, given up all hope of seeing land again, all hope of hugging friends and family, all hope of living, all hope of seeing their grandchildren. Now they had found their way back, to somewhere, anyway. One by one, they tried to stand up in the shallow water. The island tilted and swayed under their feet, as though they were still at sea. All three of them collapsed to their knees. Reynolds could not get up. He crawled toward the beach. Whitaker and DeAngelis each leaned on an oar and hobbled like an old man to shore. At 3.45 that afternoon, on the island of Funafuti, Radio Man Second Class Lester Butte took his seat in the rear of an OST... 2U Kingfisher Seaplane. Sea the plane was an awkward-looking thing, with a bloated cigar of a pontoon suspended from the middle of the fuselage. Butte's pilot, Lieutenant Frederick Woodward, taxied toward the middle and opened the throttle. The plane picked up speed, skidded across the salt water, and lifted into the air. It was just another evening patrol for Butte and Woodward. The Marines had occupied Funafuti six weeks ago, and they've been flying patrols ever since. The Japanese base in the Gilberts lay 500 miles north. The idea was to keep the enemy from moving south to threaten the shipping route to Australia. From the air over Funafuti, you could already see anti-aircraft guns guarding the beach, giant searchlights marking both ends of the island, an airfield taking shape among the palm trees. Woodward and Butte started their usual circuit, looking for signs of Japanese planes, ships, or subs. Fifty minutes into the patrol, Butte spotted a speck of yellow on the waves below. Woodward banked and dropped low over the water. The two flyers got close enough to make out an emaciated man with rags for clothes. Butte's pulse quickened. What else could the ragged figure be but a survivor from the lost B-17 that had gone down with Eddie Rickenbacker aboard? All American forces in the area were operating under strict radio silence to keep Japanese intelligence in the dark, but Woodward and Butte sped back to Funafuti and dropped a message to their commander. The commander dispatched a PT patrol torpedo boat with orders to rush to the area, find their survivor, and pick him up. By 9.30 p.m., Captain Bill Cherry had been lifted from the donut by the crew of the PT boat and was sitting aboard the USS Hilo. His body was covered in saltwater ulcers. His skin was red and raw to the touch. He weighed 45 pounds less than he did when he left Hickam Field three weeks earlier. But he was healthy enough to tell his rescuers that there were two more rafts floating not far from where he was found. In them were six more men, each of them alive for now. Whitaker, DeAngelis, and Reynolds slept that night on land with a raft over them for shelter. They had made their way to the other side of the island, where the trees blocked the wind and sun. They seemed to have landed at the very end of a peninsula where the island was only a few hundred yards across. So far, there were no signs of other inhabitants, American or Japanese. One way across the island, they collected coconuts 
that had fallen to the ground, but they were so weak it took them 40 minutes to cut through a single shell. When they set up camp, a swarm of rodents came to investigate. Whitaker managed to club two of them to death. Then he went back to the beach, where pockets of coral poked above the surface of the ocean. Rainwater had puddled in the coral, and he painstakingly filled a life vest. He brought his stash back to the men. They feasted on dry, overripe co coconut pulp, raw rodent meat, and fresh water. After the meal, Reynolds only looked worse. His eyes had sunk a half inch into his skull. He had gone from 130 to 90 pounds. If they didn't find help soon, he wasn't going to make it. When they lay down and pulled the raft over them, they, the ground seemed to sway more violently than the ocean had on their worst nights at sea. The next morning, at first light, all five Kingfisher seaplanes based on Funafuti took to the air. Four PT boats fanned out across the sea. The planes flew in formation, searching Area A, one of three zones they had mapped out the night before. By mid-morning, they had found nothing. The planes refueled, then split into two groups and searched areas B and C. Still nothing. An emergency signal came in from an island 60 miles northwest of Funafuti. It turned out to be nothing, too. By mid-afternoon, the kingfishers had covered the areas they intended to search and were running low on fuel. It wouldn't be long before darkness shut down any hope of spotting the survivors. The flyers headed back toward Funafuti, scanning waters they had already searched just in case. That same morning, November 12th, Rickenbacker was beginning to lose hope. He and Bartek and Adamson hadn't seen a plane since the, since the raft split up. He had a strong suspicion they had traveled right through a chain of islands and drifted out to sea again. His hand shook as he poured the morning's ration of water. Adamson and Bartek could barely raise their heads to drink. Have the planes come back? Bartek mumbled. No, Rickenbacker said. They won't come back. Bartek said, I know they won't come back. Again and again, he repeated it until he lapsed into a stupor. Rickenbacker passed the time dangling his hand in the water, trying to grab fingerlings as they skittered past. He got a couple, but his hands didn't seem to be taking signals from his brain properly. He was half conscious under the afternoon sun when he felt Bartek tugging at his shirt. Listen, Captain, he said, planes, they're back. Rickenbacker looked up to see two planes fly within a couple of miles of the raft only to vanish into the clouds. Then, a half hour later, two more appeared in the west. This time, they kept coming directly at the tiny raft. At this point, none of the men were strong enough to stand up. Instead, they, they sat as tall as they could, waving shirts and hats, yelling till they went hoarse. The planes came closer and closer until one broke formation and angled down. It banked and began to circle the raft from a few hundred feet away. Its bulbous pontoon, just a hundred feet off the water, a radio man sat in the rear seat, smiling and waving at the men in the raft. Rickenbacker kept waving back, long after it was clear they had been seen. He couldn't quite convince himself that the flyers knew they were not three dead men in a raft. Yet there was no question about it. For the first time in more than three weeks, someone knew they were alive. But the pilot kept circling. In a little while, another pilot came to relieve, that, relieve him. The sun sank deeper in the west, and Rickenbacker wondered why they didn't land. Maybe the pilots had called for a PT boat to come pick them up. But once darkness fell, the plane would return to base. There was no way a boat would be able to find them in the dark, and they could drift 10, maybe 20 miles overnight. Wasn't it possible they would be lost again, this time for good? By late afternoon, the Kingfisher Squadron on Funafuti could congratulate themselves. They had found Rickenbacker. Now they had to get him home. For Lieutenant Ed William Eady, Commander of the squadron, that was a problem. Landing a kingfisher in mid-ocean was no easy task. And even if a pilot landed safely, how would he transport three passengers in a plane designed for two people? He would have no chance of taking off with the extra weight. The force commander on Funafuti broke radio silence at 5.40 p.m. for the first time since Marines arrived on the island. He radioed coordinates for Rickenbacker's raft to the four PT boats. But the nearest boat was at least five hours from the raft. It would be pitch dark by the time it arrived. When the news came in from the PT boats, Edie made a decision. With rodeoman Lester Butte in the rear, he would take off for Rickenbacker's raft and try to pick up their survivors himself. At some point in the afternoon, Jim Whitaker had been standing on the beach staring out at the ocean. It was hard to tell in the sunlit glare, but it looked like a squadron of ships was headed for the island. Destroyers, maybe.
He shook DeAngelis awake. They had gone back in the raft that morning and rowed south along the shore until they found a small hut on the beach. It was a modest thing, but it was the first sign of civilization they had seen in three weeks. To Whitaker, it might as well have been New York City. They had found fresh rainwater and some broken coconut shells and then went back to sleep. D'Angelo sat up when Whitaker shook him, then looked out at the water. They're just barges, he mumbled, and lay back down to close his eyes. Just barges? Whitaker yelled. What do you want? The Queen Mary? Whitaker scrambled to the raft and rowed out to meet the squadron. As it drew closer, the sun's glare lifted, and what Whitaker had thought to be destroyers were revealed to be outrigger canoes, crewed by islanders. The men in the lead boat welcomed Whitaker to their home. By tying his raft to their boat, they sped to shore, and a young man jumped out with a crude machete and a length of rope. He wrapped the rope around a coconut tree and scrambled up with ease. By the time Whitaker arrived at the hut with the rest of the outrigger crew, there was fresh coconut milk waiting. He and DeAngelis and Reynolds drank it in. The islanders helped them aboard the canoe and sped off around the coast of the island. By evening, they sat in a village of small huts with thatched palm fronds for roofs. The smell of chicken soup hung in the air. The rescuers were residents of Nukafute and were already hosting a wireless station manned by Allied intelligence officers from New Zealand. Earlier that day, a plane from Funafuti had dropped a message asking the station to be on the lookout for survivors from the B-17. The villagers welcomed Whitaker and his ragged companions with open arms. Some of them wept openly when they saw how emaciated the men were. A 19-year-old islander named Toma presented Whitaker with a miniature model of the canoe he had been rescued in. Jim America, Tomer called him. Two New Zealanders from the wireless station soon arrived with the news that they had radioed Funafuti. The officers poured fruit juice for the survivors, and for one, for once, Whitaker could watch the sunset without it tormenting him. Just before dark, a Navy Kingfisher from Funafuti taxied into the lagoon. A military doctor jumped from its rear, rear seat and, ferried, and hurried ashore. With him were the glucose injections that would finally give Jim Reynolds' starved body the fuel it needed to survive. While Whitaker, DeAngelis, and Reynolds filled themselves with chicken soup, Rickenbacker floated miles away, free fretting. He watched the sun disappear over the horizon with dread. A kingfisher still circled overhead, but a dark squall hung over the southern sky. If they weren't picked up tonight, and that squall caught them, who knew how far it would blow them? As the last bit of light faded, a blinding white flare lit the sky beneath the kingfisher. A minute later, the plane shot another flare, this one red. In the eerie glow, the pilot angled down, knifed his pontoon into the water, and settled into a smooth landing. He taxied to the raft and shut his engine down. Rickenbacker rode close enough to grab the pontoon. The man in the rear sat, climbed, seat climbed into the wing and introduced himself. Radio man Luster Boutte. Pilot was Lieutenant William Eady. To Rickenbacker, who had lost 40 pounds, the man looked like the strongest, healthiest human beings he had ever seen. Fute and Eady lifted Adamson eight feet into the rear seat of the plane. A PT boat was on its way, Eady said, but he didn't want to fire another flare for fear there were Japanese in the area. Without the light, there was no guarantee the PT boat would find them. They weren't going to wait. He and Fute hoisted him hoisted Bartek onto the right wing and Rickenbacker onto the left. Butte tied them to each other and ran the line through the cockpit. Edie fired up the engine and they started to taxi across the ocean toward Funafuti, 40 miles away. They hadn't gone more than a few miles when the dark outline of a PT boat appeared in front of them. Minutes later, Rickenbacker sat aboard the boat, sipping beef broth and pineapple juice. Bartek lay exhausted on a mat in the cabin. The boat captain led the Kingfisher with Adamson still aboard back to Funafuti. For three weeks, the seven survivors had not been 40 feet apart. They shared water parceled out by the ants and food that might have amounted to one decent meal. Now they were scattered among two islands, a boat and a plane. Two of them, Adamson and Reynolds, were clinging to life. Alex had been lost to the sea, but the rest had survived, and when the next night came, they would all be sleeping in beds. Rickenbacker, it turned out, had been the lucky one lucky once again. Just before dawn in the morning of November 13th, he and Bartek and Adamson were carried ashore on stretchers. Lying on his back, Rickenbacker watched the moon glimmer through the palm trees. It was, he thought, one of the most beautiful things he had ever seen.